second half of Session 9, History 3380, World Civilizations. What we're looking at in Session 9 are issues regarding modernization in various types of societies. In the first half, we looked at Germany and Japan as two countries that had, in fact, modernized, at least in the sense of developing modern capitalist economies, uh, but who did so in the context of otherwise very traditional societies in the sense of the social relationships, especially those that characterized relationships in the countryside between landlords and peasants. And we saw some of the problems that that created that eventually led to the rise of fascism in both of these societies. As other modern societies, they encountered various crises such as depression, hyperinflation, and in response to those problems, given these limiting factors, these traditional societies, these non-democratic solutions to social problems, these societies leaned in the direction of totalitarian fascism. Today what we're looking at are two other societies, Russia and China, who really just started on the road to modernization at the beginning of the 20th century. They too are going to experience some significant disruptions driven mainly not by the full-blown effects of modernization, but by their attempt to rapidly achieve modern societies. They attempted to push themselves forward far more rapidly than countries in the West had done, deliberately trying to create the kinds of societies and economies they saw elsewhere. But in so doing, as we will see, they set up all kinds of other forces that led to massive revolutions that led again to totalitarian solutions, this time in the form of communism. If we look at the first slide, what I've done here is outline the three major topics that we're going to look at today, because I'm going to look at Russia and China comparatively. So as we're talking about the challenges of modernity in Russia and China, we're going to look at these three topics. Hmm. First is the old order in modernization. In other words, what did these societies look like, especially by the 19th century? How did they try to press forward with this process of modernization? What were they doing exactly to try to create a rapid process of change in their societies? Secondly, we're going to look at that actual process of rapid change of modernization and some of the complications, problems, challenges that arose as a result of attempting to push forward this process at great speed, and particularly in the context of these very pre-modern societies in terms of their social and political structures. And finally, we'll look at the outcome in both cases, which was mass revolution, and in both cases, the imposition of communist states, although communist states, which we will see, were significantly different in some ways in terms of what they tried to achieve. But these are the three stages that we're going to look at and looking comparatively. We'll look at both Russia and China in each of these stages because they're not identical. I mean, the paths are not identical, but they are similar. They are trying to accomplish similar things. Uh, China is less centralized in its effort at rapid modernization uh, than is Russia. Uh, the Russian state was at least somewhat stronger than the Chinese state was by the end of the 19th century, but still they were both significantly weakened. And as I said, their revolutions turn out somewhat differently, but they are both communist revolutions, even though they have somewhat different aspirations. First, the old order. In 1649, the Russian czarist regime legalized serfdom. Serfdom, again, is essentially a form of slavery. Uh, the only difference being that peasants who are enserfed cannot be separated from the estate on which they work. They have to be sold with the estate. Now, there had been serfs in Russia long before this decree. The difference was that now this was a legal status, and as a result, far more peasants would find themselves subordinated as serfs rather than as free peasants because now it was legal to do so. Now, why did the Tsar, the emperor, approve such a decree? Well, essentially, it was because of things that were going on in the West. As the West was growing and urban centers were growing, population was rebounding some three centuries after the Black Death. Urban areas were growing. 
there was increasing demand for grain to feed these populations. So there's a tremendous market opportunity. Now, a market opportunity can be responded to in different ways. If we talked about this in the 20th or 21st centuries and said, well, gee, there's a growing agricultural market over here, we would assume that a country would then go out and uh, employ more tractors, more fertilizer, uh, other logical methods of increasing productivity to produce more food to export to that market. But in Russia of the 17th century, the logical answer, in the absence of considerable technology, uh, with an abundance of labor available, was simply to work the peasants harder to produce more product. And that's what serfdom allowed the landowners to do, since these people were now tied to the land for life. Now they could work them even harder to try to generate more exports for those markets in the West. And that's precisely what they did, and they were successful. The downside, as we will see, is there are limits to this. You can only work so, somebody so hard, as you may have experienced in your own life. Uh, once somebody has you working 10, 12, 14 hour shifts, at a certain point, your efficiency starts to droop. You know, you start to fall asleep on the job. That last latte you served was all water, because uh, you're exhausted. Well, human beings are the same way in the 17th and 18th and 19th centuries. You can't just work them relentlessly. To get more out of them, in modern societies, what you do is you add technology. Okay, if that secretary can only write so fast, we'll give her a typewriter. Has a typewriter, word processor, and so forth. So maybe she's still only working eight or nine, ten hours a day, but we're getting more out of her because we have technology. That was not the solution in Russia. It was to try to squeeze more labor out of the peasants. Again, it would have limitations. Now, in subsequent centuries, the, this pr underlying problem wasn't terribly apparent. Russia in the 18th and certainly first half of the 19th century was considered one of the great empires of the world. The Russians had successfully fended off Napoleon's invasion. They had one of the largest land armies in the world. Uh, the Tsar of Russia was considered perhaps the most powerful monarch in the world. But the underlying problems of a lack of innovation, a lack of efficiency, became apparent in what was called the Crimean War, a war whose causes we don't have to get into. All we really need to know is that it pitted France and England against Russia, fighting essentially on Russian territory, and the Russians lost. And they lost because they weren't efficient. They didn't have the modern arms and transportation technologies the European powers had. So it exposed a fundamental problem within Russian society. And very soon after this, the Tsar abolished serfdom. This was not an act of generosity, but an act of practical policy making. That something had to be done about this inefficient system. And one thing that had to be done is agriculture had to be made more efficient. And as long as agriculture was dominated by serf labor, it wasn't going to get more efficient. So one of the things that clearly had to be done was to improve agricultural productivity, improve efficiency. This was one step in that direction. The other major process that would be linked to this was industrialization. And indeed, if you're going to industrialize, which to most people in the 19th and early 20th century meant modernize, if you're going to industrialize, you need plenty of agricultural product being produced efficiently so you can feed those workers who you're going to attract to factories. So that was the logical link between agriculture and industry. But Russia really didn't have the wherewithal to industrialize. It didn't have the capital, didn't have the technology, didn't have the institutions in terms of modern banking systems, etc. So another important part of this process was going to be the encouragement of foreign investors, particularly Germans, French, some British, to pour money into Russia to build up industry and to provide the financing and technology that industry would require. So this project of rapid modernization was going to include a substantial infusion of foreign involvement. And that itself 
would have an impact on what happened in Russia in the decades ahead. Now, in China, the decline is a little bit more obvious. Uh, no one really thought, let us say, in the 18th century that China was still the dominant empire of the world. Still very important, still had perhaps the largest economy in the world. But there were serious signs of decline that became ever more apparent as we advance into the 19th century. One of the problems in China was that landowners had really come to dominate society, large landowners. Throughout the centuries, Chinese emperors had tried to balance between the interests of peasants and large landowners. Large landowners constituted the elite, the key supporters of the emperor. But at the same time, if they were to expand their interests to the total detriment of the peasants, they would set off peasant revolutions. And in fact, peasant rebellion was endemic in Chinese history because periodically, indeed, empires would weaken, landowners would grab more land, the peasants would become infuriated, and a crisis would ensue. Well, that was happening once again in China, certainly by the 19th century. One of the problems is that the scholarly gentry, the trained bureaucrats who were supposed to keep a balance within the system, who were the judiciary, who would rule on counterclaims between landowners and peasants, they had been co-opted by the large landowners. Many of the gentry, to get to where they were, to go through all those years of study, in order to become members of the scholarly gentry, had relied on the largesse of large landowners. So they were beholden to these people. So more and more decisions went in favor of the large landowners and against the peasantry. So we have mounting discontent within the rural areas as the balance tips ever more significantly towards the large landowners. Another problem that we've already seen coming was population growth. Part of this was fed by increased food production, which had occurred over a number of centuries, in part due to the expansion of the amount of arable land, opening up new areas, cutting down trees, filling in marshes, new food products coming from the discovery of the Americas in part, things like potatoes, peanuts, root vegetables like squash, etc. This had helped accelerate the survival rate within the population and therefore accelerated population growth to the point where by 1900 China had 467 million people. The problem was that China's own technological innovation had been slowing for centuries, hmm. ever since at least the 17th century. Hmm. China was not adopting new innovations. Yes, there were still irrigation channels, yes, natural fertilizer was still being used, but that's not going to be enough to keep up with this exploding population. So food shortages and inevitable famine and the spread of epidemic disease are becoming a constant problem during the 19th century. With China's state system weakened, hmm? the scholarly gentry hmm? less inclined to be objective, impartial bureaucrats, the pressures of hmm? population explosion in the face of a lack of technological innovation, China also had to face challenges from the rising West. We saw this in the Opium War where the British had demanded the right to trade opium in China. China refused. British forced them to accept the import of opium as a result of this war. And it also led to the principle of extraterritoriality, the right of not only the British, but the Russians, the French, the Germans, to share control of virtually all of China's major coastal cities, the places that were the core of China's economy, the places where international trade occurred, the places where, as we will see, industry was springing to life. All of this, now they have to share with the European powers. So we have a state that is in serious, serious decline in terms of its own powers. So what we have in both China and Russia are actually weak autocratic states. 
clearly, the case is more obvious in China as of 1900 than, let's say, Russia. But the fact is, in both of these cases, you have old autocratic systems and dynasties ruling their countries, and yet not having the modern mechanisms, not having the efficient administrative networks to actually effectively control these vast empires that they still ruled over. Personifying this weakness in Russia was the Tsar, our emperor, Nicholas. And his wife, his consort, the Tsarina Alexandra. It would be hard to imagine two people who are less suited to rule an empire than Nicholas and Alexandra. They had trouble running their own household, never mind an empire that encompassed tens of millions of people. They were not competent. Evidence of their incompetence came in their relationship with a religious figure known as the mad monk Rasputin. The only male heir that Nicholas and Alexandra had produced suffered from hemophilia and was unlikely to survive to adulthood. And yet, the throne was dependent on his succession. Rasputin claimed to have the ability to intercede with the divine in order to spare the boy's life. And as a result, he became a household figure with Nicholas and Alexandra, and what was worse, became a principal advisor to them on matters of state. In other words, when Russia enters the First World War, one of the people influencing Nicholas and Alexandra is a mad monk. Uh, not probably the best kind of combination for success. Um, in China, signs of decay were equally clear at the top. By the 19th century, the Qin emperors had become virtually totally dependent on the palace eunuchs who advised them on every phase of imperial policy. Now, eunuchs had had a growing role in the empire long before the Qin, hmm. all the way back to the Ming and prior to that. The logic was that, of course, since Chinese emperors depended on uh, harems, really, a significant number of consorts or women uh, with whom they would produce numerous offspring to ensure that there would be a viable male heir, to ensure that those offspring were not the product of a liaison with someone other than the emperor, uh, the harems would be overseen by eunuchs, men who, of course, no longer had the capacity to produce children. Over time, the eunuchs took on a far larger role as advisors to the emperor. And by the time of the Qin, the problem is that the emperors are becoming less and less connected with the elite, the nobility, who had comprised, along with the mandarins, their principal advisors. And more and more, this barrier stood between the emperor and those traditional elites, the nobility and the scholarly gentry, a barrier composed of eunuchs. So there's increasing isolation on the part of the Qin emperors, a lack of full realization of the problems within their society. Even without these difficulties that were affecting both states, the fact is a major problem that has addressed one society after another, and in fact is a critical problem in China today, is industrializing within peasant societies. The basic issue is to industrialize, as I mentioned earlier, you need to produce agricultural products efficiently in large amounts for commercial consumption, meaning you'll be able to feed the growing urban populations, the worker populations, who will man your industries for you. Peasant agriculture is not suited 
to that kind of enterprise. Peasants traditionally grow a diverse array of crops to ensure their survival. What industrialized society requires are commercial enterprises, usually of large scale, to produce large amounts of agricultural products to feed the cities. So there's a fundamental difficulty. In modern day China, this problem continues today. Millions of people have been leaving the rural areas because there's a lack of land, because agriculture is now moving into this commercialization phase as China rapidly industrializes. And China has had an almost impossible time trying to control those populations. Basically, the Chinese government has declared it illegal to emigrate from the countryside to the city. And if you do so and settle in the city, you don't have legal status. Your children aren't allowed to attend public school because legally you're not there. Because the danger is that these millions of people will flood the cities and overwhelm social services and the economy. But at the same time, if agriculture doesn't change, then you won't be producing enough cheap food to keep the industrial growth pattern going. A constant problem and one that was certainly critical in both of these countries as they tried this rapid modernization in the early 20th century. The other problem was foreign capital. It certainly was essential in the kinds of efforts that they were making to rapidly modernize and industrialize. But foreign capital would also raise serious objections from much of the population. When industrialization occurred and workers developed resentments towards long hours, low wages, unemployment, much of that blame was placed on foreigners. That the foreigners are the ones, I mean, who controls most of the factories in the urban centers of Russia? Foreigners. So who do you blame? The foreigners. And of course, this kind of mobilization against the foreigners is difficult for these states to control. After all, how do you object to the fact that your workers are expressing nationalistic sentiments? They're attacking foreigners for their problems. If you say, no, no, we're going to suppress your, those demonstrations and protests against the foreigners, then it sounds as if you're not a very much of a nationalist yourself, even though you are the ruler of this country. So this became another problem, how to deal with the objections to this dominant influence that foreigners were taking in much of the modernization process. Now, Despite these problems, there's no question that modernization moved rapidly ahead, especially in Russia. Iron production increased 1,000% between 1860 and 1900. It's a lot. That's, of course, a major measure of industrialization that you're producing iron. In the city of St. Petersburg by 1902, what had been largely an administrative capital for Russia had become a major industrial center with one and a half million workers. The Tsarist government saw to the building of the Trans-Siberian Railroad, another sign of modernization. Rapid modern transportation, able to move not only people, but raw materials from the eastern provinces of the empire to the west where industrialization was taking place. And again, all of this would have been largely impossible if it weren't for the fact that foreigners, mostly Europeans, were providing enormous amounts of capital. 60% of the industrial capital in developing Russia was coming from outside of the country. And it wasn't just a matter of capital. We're talking about entrepreneurs who go and build factories, manage those factories, foreign managers, supervisors, the interaction between foreigners and Russians in the industrial plant is very direct. So again, when workers have complaints, the people they're focused on usually are the foreigners who they see as exploiting them. In China, the process was less centrally directed. 
But nevertheless, it was clear that at a number of different levels, the Chinese were pursuing a process of modernization, and that again, foreigners were going to play an important role in it. In China, as we've seen, the merchant class was considered second class. Merchants were not considered to be viable members of the elite, no matter how wealthy they were. They were seen as really exploiting both producers and consumers as they purchased for low prices products they later sold at higher prices to consumers. But that was changing if only because the power of the merchants was growing. As contacts with the West increased, and they certainly accelerated rapidly after the Opium War in 1839, when more and more ports were opened up, Western merchants came and became a major presence throughout coastal Russia, uh, Russia, China, and well into the provinces, at least the eastern provinces, because they would move along the riverways and set up shop in the major cities along the largest rivers in China. They naturally interacted with their counterparts. The easiest way to do business in China was to work through Chinese merchants. So Chinese merchants are benefiting from this influx of foreigners who have come to not only sell and buy goods, but who increasingly, as the 19th century progresses, will begin investing in factories as well seeing here an opportunity, as foreign investors saw in Russia, to exploit cheap labor. Labor was incredibly cheap in China, therefore you could manufacture products there, ship them home, and still undersell your competitors back in Europe. Now, the Chinese were well aware of many of these problems. They had to be, given the Taiping Rebellion and the enormous damage it did to China in the middle of the 19th century. One of the things that sprang out of the disastrous effects of the Taiping Rebellion was what was called the self-strengthening movement. The self-strengthening movement was largely adopted by provincial officials, although it was certainly sanctioned by the emperor. And what it meant was that the Chinese wanted to adopt certain aspects of Western culture to try to modernize. They were not interested in absorbing Western culture as a whole, meaning Western values, but they did want to absorb the technologies, the methods of doing things that they saw as so effective in the hands of Europeans. So the self-strengthening movement would do things like build schools and have curriculum focused on mathematics, science, the kinds of things that they knew were essential for a modern society and a modern economy. They were not interested in you know, reading the French literary classics or reading about the British Parliament, but they did want the practical knowledge and technology. Uh, so too, there was an effort to modernize the Chinese military, to make it a modern bureaucratic instrument rather than the very traditional kind of, for example, in the 19th century, you had actually three different levels of armies, uh, two major ones operating at the national level. And this dated all the way back to the time of the Mongol invasion. And then a third army, which essentially consisted of local militias. Well, that's not the way modern armies work. You're supposed to have a modern professional army, trained bureaucrats running it. And that's what they tried to create in China, certainly in the latter decades of the 19th century. Again, following Western models. Aside from these state-directed initiatives, a Chinese business class was arising. Essentially, those merchants who were making money in trade with Westerners were looking for new opportunities that didn't involve just trade. If Westerners had ideas about industrialization. Certainly Chinese entrepreneurs had the same ideas. Much of this effort was focused in and around Shanghai, not just the city, but the region surrounding. And here, a rapid process of industrialization was taking place. It was far less so in the rest of 
the empire, but in Shanghai there certainly was a massive industrialization process. The development of textile plants, of power plants, a variety of undertakings. And much of it directed by Chinese entrepreneurs. At another level, there was not only the effort to reform the military, but at the imperial level, an effort to reform the bureaucracy as a whole and to reform the entire educational system and rationalize it. China, if we just talk about bureaucracy for a moment, had once been the sort of gold standard hmm, for the development of the scholarly gentry. Hmm. In the pre-modern world, no society enjoyed a more efficient government administration than the Chinese with the system of trained bureaucrats. But this was not a modern bureaucracy. These people were not the individual trained specialists that characterize modern bureaucracy. Look at a modern government bureaucracy, you've got people who are specialists in economics, political science, the military, planning, and the list goes on and on. Health sciences, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Those who are bureaucrats in the modern world are specialists. That was not what scholarly gentry were. They were generalists. They did everything. They were involved in the judiciary, they were involved in running the military, they collect taxes, so on and so forth. So China wanted to change that. And imperial reforms began in a serious way in 1898. However, the problem is, who are the current bureaucrats? They are tens of thousands of scholarly gentry. And neither they nor the eunuchs were particularly fond of the idea of creating a modern bureaucracy with people trained in specialties such as economics and planning to run the country. This was anathema to them. It was contrary to their interests. So while reforms are begun, they're not going to progress very rapidly because the existing structure, the status quo, is so adamantly opposed to this kind of change. By 1911, despite these reforms that were, had been attempted and despite the signs of industrialization in places like Shanghai, the imperial system was a shell of its former self. The Taiping Rebellion, as I mentioned when we talked about that, had caused the emperor to encourage local landowners to arm themselves and create their own militias in order to put down the rebellion. It worked, but it also meant that a considerable amount of power had been effectively transferred from the emperor to these landowners. They now exercise considerable military power in their own regions. That monopoly on violence that's so essential to a centralized government had now been broken. And the so-called warlords, who are these armed landowners, start exercising increasing control over the provinces in which they live. Finally, a rebellion in 1911, although short-lived, toppled the Qin Dynasty and gave way to the establishment of the Chinese Republic under Sun Yat-sen, a Western-trained doctor. Both Sun Yat-sen and his successor, Chiang Kai-shek, were committed nationalists who also were committed to modernization. They were typical of many 20th century revolutionaries. Whatever names we place on these people, we call them nationalists, communists, whatever. So many of the 20th century's revolutionaries were first and foremost nationalists and people committed to rapid modernization. Chiang Kai-shek, who effectively ruled China from the mid-1920s on, tried to modernize by promoting 
the Chinese business class, which had been, of course, seen as a group of second-class subjects by the imperial order. Encouraging and paying for, at times, the building of railroads, modern transportation. But even as they promoted this very progressive process that we want modern industry, modern transportation, the fact is that Chiang Kai-shek, in order to maintain himself in power, also relied on the support of the landed elite. Many of the, these same warlords who had challenged the power of the emperor. What that meant was that it's going to be very difficult to try to modernize the agricultural sector, <coughs> where methods of production remain very traditional, because that would require radical change in the countryside that would disrupt the interests of the landed elite and undermine some of the key supporters of the new regime. So in both Russia and China, we get forms of authoritarian modernization. These are top-down state systems. They don't pretend to be democracies whether it's the old Qin dynasty or it's the new nationalist government of Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek, or they talk about the czarist regime in Russia. They don't pretend to be democratic in any way, but they are concerned with modernizing their societies. They're going to try to do it rapidly. But at the same time, they're going to face some of the incongruities that exist within these societies that are still so very traditional and still so much characterized by peasant agriculture. And the problem becomes, how do you change that rapidly in order to ensure modernization? It becomes one of the problems that confront these two state systems as they advance down this road of modernization. Now, in looking at the actual modernization process itself and reactions to it, in Russia, there was land reform with the abolition of serfdom, clearly one of the issues was, well, abolishing serfdom is fine, but you have to give the peasants land in order for them to have something to work. So there would be a land reform in the closing decades of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century. However, in keeping with its sort of autocratic spirit of trying to control change, in Russia, the Tsarist government decided on what I've called traditional land reform. And what I mean by this is that traditionally in peasant villages in Russia, this was common in other peasant societies, peasants controlled not a single, let's say, rectangular box of land. They tended to control strips of land the land in the village might well be carved up where the first strip belongs to one peasant, the next strip to another, then to a third, a fourth, and then repeating the pattern, the first peasant gets another strip, etc. So you don't have these nice blocks of land. You have strips scattered throughout the village. The reason for this was to be more equitable in the distribution of land, that each person would likely get some land that was a little rocky, other land that was reasonably fertile, some land might be a little dry, others a little moist. So you got a reasonable distribution rather than one person controlling a block that was perhaps the best land in the village. The Tsarist regime, when it turned land over to the peasants, decided to continue that pattern because they didn't want to disrupt peasant society. The downside was that that was the least efficient way to distribute it. It's a little difficult to buy a tractor and then say, well, I got a three foot wide strip. <laughs> I'm going to run the tractor over and then move down and do the next, you know, hey, buddy, your wheels are on my strip. Uh, doesn't work. But on the other hand, the Tsar was afraid of disrupting the peasants. In addition to that, the Tsarist regime was also afraid of offending the large landowners, the aristocracy. So their decisions in terms of taking land from the aristocracy or the large landowners and giving it to the peasants 
always favored the large landowners. In other words, the best land was still going to remain in the hands of the elite. This set off a series of contentious battles between the mirrors, which were the, we'll call them the communal governments of peasant communities, the sort of peasant councils, and the aristocrats. The mirrors, which were essentially the peasants' form of representation, would be in constant battle with the local landowners over land distribution, rights to and access to water, etc. So as much as the Tsar tried to prevent unrest in the countryside, even this traditional land reform set off acute conflict. In the cities, millions of people were being drawn into these new industrial plants and experiencing full-blown capitalism, industrial capitalism, very abruptly. Now, if we look back at industrialization in Western Europe, it occurs over several centuries. People gradually migrate. We talked about the putting out system and how that starts and then more elaborate organizations. So over a number of generations, people are exposed to this way of doing things, this, the discipline of capitalist labor, the uncertainty of the marketplace. But all of this is happening very suddenly in Russia. Huge factories, poor pay, often abusive discipline, creates deep-seated resentment towards the industrialists, and of course, especially towards the foreigners who comprise much of the industrial class. So we also have growing unrest in the urban areas as this process is pushed along rapidly and people unaccustomed to industrial labor suddenly have to cope with all of these problems. Also alienated are the educated elite of Russia. People who have gained university educations. Many of these people, most of them, would support modernization, and the creation of modern society. But they did not support what they saw as this highly autocratic rule by the Tsar. For the intelligentsia, most of whom were left out of this process, the Tsar was simply creating economic mechanisms to preserve his autocratic rule. <laughs> so you have an educated class which is providing the leadership for much of the discontent that erupts in the country as Russia tries to modernize rapidly. The thing you don't want to do in a society is alienate the people who are the idea providers, the people who help form opinion. If they feel that they are being left out of the system, then they can provide critical leadership for the opposition. In China, as the process of modernization is going on, despite Chiang Kai-shek's efforts to create a centralized government, he still has to go to battle with many of these warlords in the countryside. By no means are all of them going to support the new centralized government. Many of them want to maintain their own independent rule, something they've grown accustomed to in the decades since the Taiping Rebellion. Meanwhile, Peasants have been progressively facing increasing loss of land. And they are literally up in arms over that process. Meanwhile, the merchants, and let's ex expand that and say the business class, find that still they are excluded from the political process. The scholarly gentry are the mandarins, along with the eunuchs, they still dominate. But the merchants and business class are ever more insistent on gaining access to power. <coughs> Excuse me. All of this turmoil is running through Chinese society in the early 20th century. Added to it, the influence of foreigners, the imposition of the treaty ports, 
the spread of foreign missionaries, Christian missionaries coming from Europe. The Chinese strongly resent what they feel is the sacrifice of Chinese sovereignty to these foreigners. And they frequently blame foreign missionaries for creating, and merchants I might add, not only the foreign missionaries but foreign merchants, for creating many of the problems that China has. There's a scarcity of food, epidemic disease, political disruption. Much of that is blamed on foreign influence. The Boxer Rebellion in 1899-1901 helped illustrate this deep resentment. The boxers named for them. This is a Western term for them uh, because of the exercises they did that made them look like they were engaged in boxing. They were actually a society that mixed uh, military practices with spiritual exercises. They were actually known as the Righteous Harmony Society. But what they really represented, however you term them, boxers are the Righteous Harmony Society, they were adamantly opposed to the influence of foreigners on China's development. So whether we're talking about the effort of the emperors to modernize or later the nationalists, we have these growing sources of unrest, conflict between peasants and landlords, between merchants and mandarins, between the local population and foreign missionaries and foreign merchants. All of this has been building up. And even the collapse of the dynasty in 1911 and the establishment of nationalist power is not going to end these discontents. In Russia, the growing tensions finally erupt in 1905. On January 22, 1905, a group of workers in St. Petersburg, the capital, marched on the Winter Palace. They were not marching to protest against the Tsar. They were marching to appeal to the Tsar to help them. It was massive unemployment. Mm -hmm. These people lacked wages. They were short of food. They were desperate. And they hoped to appeal to the Tsar to intervene on their behalf. After all, that's what the Tsar was supposed to be there for, this paternalistic figure. Just as previous Tsars down through the centuries had supposedly been these protectors of the people. Well, now the people came looking for protection. The Tsar was not at the palace, but armed guards were sent out on horseback to cut down the protesters. And hundreds of protesters were killed. This was a sign of, again, that this process of modernization, with all its discontents, is in the hands of an autocratic regime that will not brook any dissent. Subsequent to Bloody Sunday, a more general rebellion erupted in Russia in 1905 and was only finally put down when members of the elite decided that the greater danger lie in the course of revolution and they preferred to adhere to their support of the Tsar. But the Tsar was well aware of the great risk his regime had been at as a result of this rebellion. And in 1906, he called together the Duma. Now the Duma is an institution much like the English Parliament, the Estates General in France. It too had been periodically called together, usually for the purposes of arranging new taxes, new revenues for the Tsarist regime. And this Duma, well, it supposedly had a larger mandate, was composed largely of the upper classes of Russia. The gentry, the sort of mid-level landowners, large landowners, members of the nobility, and business people. What the Tsar hoped was that calling the Duma together would give people at least the impression that now there was a mechanism by which he was soliciting the opinions of his subjects and creating a more representative form of government. That was at least the impression he wanted to leave. But he really wasn't interested in creating effective mechanisms that would allow the Duma to become 
a real legislature that would have real power. The Duma can only buy time for the regime. And as time passes, the same discontents, among peasants and workers especially, continue to mount. And then comes the final catastrophic decision by the Tsar to join World War I. Now, in some ways, he was led to this decision by past policies, an elaborate series of alliances tied Russia to England and to France against Germany. But the idea that Russia hmm, would enter into a war hmm, with the massive military and industrial might of the German Empire was an act of lunacy. Hmm? And in fact, the Russian people quickly hmm, faced disaster. Hmm? Casualties mounted into the hundreds of thousands and then the millions. As conditions grew worse, in part because Russia still lacked modern transportation, most of the troops and supplies that were brought to them at the front were brought by ox cart. And as casualties mounted in the midst of this process, Nicholas made an even worse decision, and that was to put himself in charge of the army and to go to the front to try to secure victory. A man who had basically no military experience, no practical military experience. That left Alexander and Rasputin at home to run the empire. As one member of the Duma, who was a supporter of the Tsar, said, is this madness or is it treason? Are they doing this to us because they're crazy or because they actually want to bring down the empire? And this was from an ally. So, you know, we don't know exactly how history might have turned out in certain situations, but certainly there couldn't have been a worse combination in terms of the mounting discontent over this rapid process of modernization in Russia. When it was combined with the disasters of war, and on top of all of that, a fundamentally incompetent administration. Hmm. The toll for Russia was staggering. Hmm. 1.3 million dead, 3 million prisoners of war. Hmm? The Duma effectively takes control of the situation, but it really is too late. Hmm? In the midst of this disaster, a radical group of socialists known as the Bolsheviks, emerge to prominence in Russian politics, led by Lenin, a committed Marxist who has been living in exile and who returns to Russia at this critical moment. The Bolsheviks have a very simple platform, peace, land, and bread. Peace meaning we have to make peace with Germany no matter what to survive. Hmm? Land meaning the peasants should be given land and not this kind of you know, little strip here, little strip there. We have to take all the land from the aristocracy, give it to the peasants. Hmm? And bread meaning we have to feed workers in the cities. They have to have a decent life. There's famine, disease spreading through the urban areas. We have to reverse that. In all of this turmoil, the Tsar himself finally abdicates in March of 1917. The government is now headed by a moderate socialist named Alexander Kerensky. Kerensky, however, insists that the war must go on. His argument is the Germans will make such catastrophic demands upon us if we try to sue for peace, that they'll be unacceptable. We'll lose a third of our country hmm? if we try to make peace with the Germans. So we can't afford to do that. No one will accept that. Only he did not read 
the true desperation of the Russian people. The other problem was that Kerensky was facing constant plotting against him from within the Tsarist military. Remember, the Tsarist military is made up of officers who are from the elite, who have been fundamentally loyal to the Tsar, and the last thing they want to see is this at least quasi-representative government and the end of Tsarist rule. To protect himself from these plots, he turns to the workers' councils that have developed in St. Petersburg and in Moscow. As the process of industrialization had raced forward, workers had sought to protect themselves by organizing, to make demands, for better living conditions, working conditions, etc. But unlike in other societies where we see unions formed that largely represent a specific industry or trade, etc., the workers in Russia who were living in massive barracks organized workers' councils that represented certain regions, in other words, certain parts of the city. So they weren't restricted to one industry or trade. But more than that, they took on a larger role than just demanding better wages, etc. They armed themselves. They formed militias that became known as the Red Guard. It's to these workers' militias hmm, that Kerensky now turns for protection. These armed workers, he hopes, will protect him from the plotters in the Tsarist military. Hmm? It was a nice idea. Hmm. In October of 1917, that idea proves to be a poor one. When the Red Guards, the workers' militias, storm the Winter Palace and seize control of the government in Russia. And of course, who are the influential people in the Soviets? The Bolsheviks. Lenin. They have captured control of Russia in this seizure of power in October of 1917. And, good to their word, the Bolsheviks immediately make peace with the Germans. They lose massive amounts of territory, but they make peace, which is what people desperately wanted. And they begin massive redistribution of land to peasants. And they begin working to supply food more effectively to the cities. Something is made possible, of course, by the cessation of hostilities on the Western Front. But that's not the end of conflict. Russia will be racked by civil war between 1918 and 1922, as a variety of groups challenge the Bolsheviks. Now, much of this had little to do with class interests. It had little to do with even the politics of the Tsar versus the Bolsheviks. Much of it had to do with the rebellion in various parts of the empire by various ethnic groups who no longer wanted to be part of the Russian Empire. These subordinated groups who might be Muslims, etc., or different ethnic groups, rebelled because they, they didn't care who was controlling the central government, they just wanted to break away. But whatever the reasons, Russia continued to suffer civil war until 1922. As the war rages on, four people emerge as central to the rule of Russia. All, of course, members of the Bolshevik party. Lenin, a long time party loyalist, Stalin, a relative recent comer to the Bolsheviks, Trotsky, but a man who was a leading ideologue and also the man who turned the Red Guards into the Red Army that eventually won the Civil War, and Bukharin, another long-time Bolshevik 
who was particularly concerned with issues of economic planning. Gradually, Stalin purged his enemies after Lenin's death. He eliminated both Trotsky and Bukharin. Bukharin he had executed after putting on trial. Trotsky went into exile and Stalin later arranged to have him assassinated by somebody who stabbed Trotsky in the head with an ice pick. <gasps> Tough way to go. But sort of symptomatic of the fact that Stalin was indeed ruthless in his efforts to secure and maintain power. <laughs> Stalin certainly pushed Russia into the full phase of totalitarian rule. They were purges largely of the Bolshevik party itself and the military. Most of the purges weren't aimed at external enemies. They were aimed at people within the government itself and the shipping of hundreds of thousands of people off to prison camps and eventually the death of millions of people from starvation, from imprisonment, etc. Through all of this, Stalin would in fact remain enormously popular. It's hard to believe. But it was because the Bolsheviks were offering an alternative to Russia. They too wanted to modernize, just as the Tsar did. They too were going to use the state extensively to modernize. In fact, it was going to be a state-run economy. Eventually, the state would control all aspects of the economy, whether it was agriculture, industry, commerce. But what the Bolsheviks said was that this will not be a capitalist modernization. Instead, we are going to create a modern economic system, modern industry, but one in which workers are guaranteed work, they are guaranteed housing, they are guaranteed education, <coughs> they will have guaranteed retirement. We'll create a worker's paradise. Now, admittedly, to do this, to unravel the capitalist modernization process that the Tsarist regime had set itself upon, we are going to have to take extraordinary measures. Hmm? The state will have to control virtually all aspects of the economy and of course the political system will have to be characterized by absolute control from the top. In other words, yes, we're going to have a totalitarian state. That's the only way we can create this paradise. And of course Russia did in fact industrialized with extraordinary speed. Even despite the Great Depression during the 1930s, Russia was expanding its economy at five, six, eight, ten percent a year. It rapidly became not a country with a few minor nuclei of industrial plants such as in St. Petersburg and Moscow. It became one of the largest industrial economies of the world by the end of the 1940s despite the Depression, despite World War II and the German invasion, it became a leading industrial and military power within, within the world. And along the way, it did create massive amounts of jobs for people. It did create guaranteed incomes, et cetera, et cetera. So what it offered people was an alternative to capitalist development. The idea that, look, we can still have the material benefits of industrialization, but without the rigors of capitalism where people don't know if they're going to have a job tomorrow. They don't know if they're going to earn a living wage, etc. Now, in return, you're going to have to sacrifice. Not only working hard, but also you're going to have to accept a state that has total control. Again, Going back to Robespierre and the French Revolution, we have a group of idealists who believe they can create an alternative, a modern society, but one which is equitable and fair. But they insist in order to achieve that, they must impose totalitarian rule. In China, 
the conflict there was much more direct and ideological. In Russia, the Bolsheviks, for example, during the Civil War, are fighting a variety of elements, not necessarily people who are specifically opposed to communism. But in China, there are two contesting parties. The nationalists, the group formed by Sun Yat-sen and Chiang Kai-shek, and then the Communist Party, created in China in the early 1920s. For a time, the nationalists and the communists cooperated with each other, <coughs> in part because they had similar goals. They both wanted to create a strong centralized state. They both want to modernize China. But clearly, they have fundamental ideological differences. The nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek want to create a capitalist society. The communists want to create a communist society, a state-run economic system, of redistribution of wealth. Those tensions finally led Chiang Kai-shek to purge the communists in 1927 sent the military into Shanghai. Shanghai was the headquarters of the communists. Why? Because Shanghai was the industrial center of China. That is where communists could most effectively recruit workers to their cause. With the attack on Shanghai, the communist party is left in disarray. The surviving leaders flee to the south. In the south, among the peasantry. Hmm. One of those leaders, Mao Zedong, offers an alternative vision for the future. Communist parties, whether it's the Bolsheviks, Russia, the Spartacus in Germany, etc., all believed in the fundamental idea that Karl Marx had about a working class revolution. But now, the Chinese communists had seen their work among the urban working class destroyed. And it was unlikely that they could resume that work any time in the foreseeable future. What Mao proposes is that they instead build a revolution among the peasantry. That becomes a bone of contention within the party. In the meantime, the party is going to face another problem. As they begin to rebuild their base in southern China, Chiang Kai-shek decides in 1933 that he has to eliminate this threat, sends the military to encircle the communists, and the communists are now faced with extermination. But in an extraordinary event, the communists break out of the encirclement, some 90,000 of them, and begin a long march, as it was known, some 6,000 kilometers to the northwestern province of Yenan. Hmm? By the time they get there, 90% of their numbers have died. Hmm? Only a small percentage of the original hmm? group survive. But in the mountainous region of Yunnan, which is pockmarked by caves, they find a strategic location where they can protect themselves. And of course, they are removed by thousands of miles from the central government. They also find a peasant population deeply stressed by famine, drought, where the conflict between peasants and large landowners who reached a fever pitch. Now the Communist Party fully adopts Mao's strategy. The Communists begin seizing land from landowners, holding summary trials in which landowners are convicted of exploiting the peasants and executed. And then land is redistributed to the peasants. On that basis, the Communists are able to build an enormous following in northwestern China. By the time of World War II, when the Japanese invade China, China is marked by a three-sided war. The communists, the nationalists, 
and the Japanese. Hmm. Although the Japanese primarily attacked the nationalists, the fact is that each group at some point is attacking the other. The communists attacking the nationalists, they're attacking the Japanese, and facing similar attacks from the other two. So we really have a three-sided war in China during the Second World War. With the end of World War II, Japanese influence in China collapses. Hmm? In the process, it leaves the communists in control of Manchuria hmm? in northern China. And the nationalists, in the effort to end this long battle with the communists, invade Manchuria in 1947. Hmm? But they are defeated. The communists drive them back, and by 1948, nationalist power is collapsing. Hmm? And by 1950, the Communist Party under Mao has taken full control of China. The revolution is in power. Hmm? Now, the real revolution will begin. Hmm. Basically, what the Chinese communists do is not terribly unusual compared to what happened in Russia. Very similar in some ways. Mass collectivization of land. In other words, we're taking control of agricultural land and we're putting peasants in charge of it. We'll create large collective farms where they'll work together communally to raise crops. So we'll solve the problem of the peasants and their exploitation by the landowners by creating large collective operations where the peasants can raise crops and work cooperatively together. Massive industrialization, power plants, steel plants, tractor plants to rapidly modernize just as the Soviets, the communists, the Bolsheviks wanted to do in Russia. Free education, free health services. Again, workers' paradise. Guaranteed a job, you guaranteed education for your children, you guaranteed health care. And women's rights. One of the things that's challenged at this time were arranged marriages. After the revolution, there was a rapid changeover in the decades that followed, where fewer and fewer women had to accept arranged marriages. Hmm. But most of these things would very much fit the Russian pattern, of trying to rapidly industrialize, but also create basic benefits for workers and peasants. Hmm. But Mao was not satisfied. Mao feared that what was happening, even as China engaged in these revolutionary changes, was bureaucratization. That sure, we have state-run steel plants, but don't they look just like a capitalist steel plant? There's a plant manager, there are engineers, there are the shop supervisors, and then the workers. We still have these gross inequalities, even though we're calling ourselves a communist society. Mao wanted to modernize, but in bureaucratic forms of development that he felt created basic inequalities between white collar workers, managers, and the working class. This was why he instituted the Great Leap Forward in 1958. He created agricultural communes that included not only peasants, but artisans and militias. He had communities set up blast furnaces. Why? So we wouldn't have to have large steel plants anymore. We could have small scale operations where people would work together. We wouldn't have huge bureaucracy. And what we're going to do is send intellectuals and workers to the countryside so that they can come to appreciate the sacrifice of peasants. They will understand the need for communal operation, that urban dwellers, workers, intellectuals, etc., are no better than the peasantry, that we are all of a kind. Hmm? 
This was to be the new man, someone who would think collectively and communally. Mao made another attempt to reassert this idea in 1966 with the Cultural Revolution, but failed dramatically. Hmm? After Mao's death in 1976, China took a new course, one focusing on modernization by state capitalism, one that abandoned, under Mao's successor, Deng Xiaoping, the ideas of creating an egalitarian society. Now China was going to modernize, even if it had to bureaucratize. So Mao's idea of creating a new man, an egalitarian society where all were equal, failed in the end. You could not have rapid modernization and indeed avoid the inequalities that existed in such economies and societies. So in these two cases, we see the effort to rapidly modernize lead to revolution and an attempt to create equitable but developed societies through communism.